This is part three of week one, lecture one, uh, on language change. And we talked in the first two parts about languages systematic, conventional, and arbitrary. Um, in this one, we're going to talk about some, some of the basic sort of principles of language change and how we think about language change and the different ways we approach the topic of how language changes over time. Um, so, I want you, if you haven't gone to the um, discussion board on in week one, uh, where it says, how do you think language changes, to go and post your answer there to think about why, why do you think language changes? Why does language change from generation to generation over time? Why do you speak differently from your grandparents? Why do we speak differently than people did in the, in the time of the... Uh, you know, the, the writers of the Declaration of the Independence and Constitution, why do we speak differently than they did in Shakespeare or Chaucer's time? What are, what's your theory? Go there and type it. Uh, put this on pause. Go, go, go respond. And then when you're done, come back and listen to this um, and, and watch this. And then you can sort of think about um, how your intuitions line up with the way that we think about these things. Um, so why does language change? Uh, one theory is the principle of least effort, that, some, that language gets easier over time, that pronunciation gets lazier or sloppier, um, and that uh, grammar becomes simpler. That's, and that does seem to be something at work. Things work against it, but that's one of the forces that does seem to drive language change. The word for Lord in Old English was hlafweyarda, which was a compound word. Hlaf meant loaf, as I discussed before, and weyarda, which is related to the modern warden or guard, meant guardian. So a lord was a bread guardian. And so hlafweyarda became hlafwarda, became hlafwarda, became hlaorda, became lorda, became lord. So, as you can see, the, the pronunciation gets more sort of compressed and easier over time. And you can see this working in various uh, ways. Um, uh, but sometimes it goes the other way for various reasons. But this is one of the things that happens. The, the verb system has become simplified. English used to have uh, grammatical gender like Spanish or French does, but that went away. Um, another ch force for change or another sort of... Um, mode of language change is analogy. And that is where um, something that works for one part of a language then gets extended to another. So words that once upon a time were strong verbs um, have become weak verbs, uh, so, or, and sometimes vice versa. A strong verb is a word like break, broke. Right, it's a word. It's a verb that changes the stem, in uh, in in order to indicate past tense or past participle. Uh, by the way, go and do the grammar self study. If some of these words like tense or participle are making no sense to you, it's linked in the um, the uh, the um, the course library. Uh, an another um, another. Uh, mode of analogy sometimes it has to do with spelling. The word delight was originally spelled D-E-L-I-T-E, -E, and it came from a Latin word, delicto, which means to, del to, to take pleasure in, right? Um, and so it was spelled D-E-L-I-T-E -E back in, in, the, in, in ye olde times, um, but uh, it was re- spelled with a gh in analogy to an old a word that was from a german root from an old germanic root licht um that had this gh this ugh sound that was indicated once upon a time by what is now silent so the spelling was changed in order to bring it into analogy with the other word there's all kinds of examples of these and sometimes um these analogies are made by children, and then we correct them, right? And this is one of the, uh, um, a mode both of change and of persistence, right? And a child said, a child says, 
I seed the puppy. And you say, no, not I seed the puppy. I saw the puppy. And the child goes, okay, um, I saw the puppy. And But if you don't correct them, then, then and nobody corrects them, then the language changes. Um, on the other hand, a child might do the other way around. Um, so this is this is another way that language changes. There's also semantic change, um, uh, and we'll talk about the various kinds of semantic change. Uh, the ch that's changes in meaning. Why a word changes over time. Another big factor that we can talk about, uh, or two big, uh, one distinction in factors causing language change that we can make is between internal and external pressure. And sometimes um, language changes because of uh, system, because of imbalances in its own system, or because um, yeah. So there's changes that have to do with the structure of the language itself, and then there are changes that have to do with historical factors. English has all these words from Romance vocabulary, uh, from French and Latin roots that we do not find in other Germanic languages like. Dutch or German, and this is because of historical cir circumstances. This because was because French-speaking people, and we're going to learn all about this, trust me, French-speaking people conquered England in 1066, and French was the prestige language of England for 300, 400 years. And so English borrowed tons and tons of words from French. And so that's an external factor in the language. I'm going to give you now a couple of uh, words that we use, vocabulary words that we use when talking about language change um, to, in order to be precise. If you've ever heard the term etymology, that's, uh, of course, we're going to learn a lot about that in this class, but that's um, the looking at the ancestry of words, looking at their roots, their origins. So an etymon is the ancestor of a word. Remember what the, ans what the etymon of lord is? That's right. It's flafwerda, flafwerda, and the the and how do we what how do we talk about the other way around? If I'm saying if I'm talking about flafwerda and I want to talk about okay, what is the modern version of that? Well, we use the word for some reason. I don't know why. We talk about the reflex of a word as the descendant of a word that has undergone change. So. Flafwerda is the etymon, lord is the reflex. And of course, these are relative to. Um, right. Uh, now, as far as semantic change, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this, we're going to come back to it time and time again. But overall, there's a few types of semantic change. Um, and there is generalization and narrowing. And there's a wonderful video I posted under recommended video, uh, the recommended videos by my um, old friend and colleague Mark Sunderham uh, um, from the uh, YouTube channel Alliterative. Generalization is when a word becomes more general over time. Narrowing is when it becomes more specific. Um, so the word stervan in Old English meant to die. Now the reflex, as you might hear, is starve. Right? So from to die to to starve, has that word undergone generalization or narrowing? That's right. It's undergone narrowing because stervan meant you could die anyway. You could get stabbed. You could fall off a cliff. You could get poisoned. Whereas, um, you know, or you could die of hunger. Whereas starve now means only dying of hunger. Words can also undergo go ameliorization or pejoration. Uh, these are fancy words for meaning getting better, ameliorization, or getting worse, pejoration. So an example of this is the word uh, knecht. Um, in Old English, knecht, in early Old English, meant a servant. Um, and then later on, it came to mean a mounted warrior and a member of the gentry or lower nobility. Uh, so I'd say that this is a word that has undergone... That's right, ameliorization. It has gotten better in its meaning. Um, pejoration, I'm trying to think of an example of this. Ah, um, well, the, the huswif meant a housewife, but that got shortened over time, uh, principle of ease, to hussy. 
And then I think you could see that as an example of pejoration. And so the, the word housewife got maybe recoined or just kind of split off. Sometimes changes are, are branching off. We can also get um, words strengthening and weakening. A word can get stronger in its meaning or weak or weaken in its meaning. And there's a tendency over time for words to get weaker rather than stronger. Remember starve uh, that, that it narrows. Starve also in some senses has, has weakened to mean in many sen- in many occasion, uh, many occasions, I'm really hungry. I'm starving. Let's go, let's go to Subway, right? No, you are not dying of hunger, but this is a common thing that happens in language. Um, that the, the force of it weakens. Awesome in the 19th century is something that you would re- use to refer to the glory of God or an emperor or a great army, not a particularly cool skateboard trick, right? So um, strengthening and weakening are processes that, that, that words undergo. Also, abstraction and concretization. Uh, words can become more abstract in meaning or more concrete um, over time. Uh, there's a tendency, and we're, and we're going to get into a lot of examples of this, so I'm not going to make this belabor this, but there's a tendency towards abstraction rather than concretization. There's a tendency to use things figuratively, and then the figurative meanings, uh, like, you know, get a grip, hold on. Um, <laughs> the figurative meaning replaces the, the specific concrete meaning. Um, there's also shifts in denotation and connotation, that is, the um, a word can... Uh, maintain a specific meaning, but but um, the kind of values that we put around it change. And so this is just an overview to introduce you to the vocabulary that we use when we discuss semantic change. We're going to continue to talk about semantic change all through the course, so expect to find these terms again. I will actually post a handout that um, gives and, and, and a link to a site that talks about semantic change more. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut off this video at this point, and the fourth video we're gonna, is gonna talk about the periods in the history of the English, and that should hopefully conclude uh, this, opening on this, this opening overview of the subject as a whole. Thank you.